the night the furnace fires are flaring Shooting out tongues of flame like leaping blood Speak to the heart of love alive and daring Sing in the boundless energies of God The depths the patient miner striving Feels in his arm the vigor of the Lord Strikes for a kingdom and his kings arrive in Hello, my name is Mark Temple. Today we are here to talk to you a little bit about the iron industry in central Pennsylvania, which started in the early 1800s and to some extent it's still around today. We're going to focus on three main aspects of the iron industry in central Pennsylvania. We're going to first focus on the mining of the iron ore, the process of actually getting the iron out of the ground. Then we're going to focus on the blast furnaces. This is where you would take that iron ore and you would smelt it down to make it into a product that was known as pig iron. From there we're going to focus on the rolling mills and the forges which would take that pig iron and actually make it into finished products such as some of the implements that were used here to actually get the iron out of the mines. The backbone of this industry was the ore. The ore that was found in this region was actually what was known as a hematite ore. It was formed over 400 million years ago during what was known as the Silurian time period and deposited in this region from the eastern end of Columbia County in Berwick all the way to the western part of Huntington County, right on the Bedford County line near Bedford, Pennsylvania. It encompassed towns such as Berwick, as I mentioned, Buckhorn, Bloomsburg, Frosty Valley, Danville, which was the major producer of iron for the region, Mosdale, Milton, continuing west into Winfield, which is just south of Lewisburg, keep going to New Berlin, to Glen Iron, to Burnham, the Greenwood Furnace, and on out through Huntington County, ending basically in Bedford, PA. Now, in the mines themselves, there would have been several types of ore that miners were interested in. The first is called the Danville ore, or fossil ore. On the left, you can see what's called the hard version, which is deeper in the ground. On the right is the soft version of the, the Danville, or fossil ore. Another ore that was mined was known as the block ore. And the block ore wasn't quite as rich in iron, but it was more prevalent. Call the block ore because when it's blasted, it tends to break into blocks. Now what makes our local iron ore so unique is that when the Appalachian Mountains formed, the rock strata bent. And what that did is it put our iron ore up at an angle. Now here at the Chalaski area, is right outside of Danville, the iron ore is at about a 70 degree pitch. Now it's about 12 inches thick at this location. Here's the bottom, here's the top. Now, obviously, if it's only 10 inches thick, that's not thick enough for a man to work to square his shoulders to drive his drill. So in some cases, we had to take some of the bottom rock or some of the top rock. So if we had to take some of the bottom rock or some of the top rock, that's what's going to end up creating our tailings outside of the mine. That's going to be our dump pile. All we got paid for was mining that ore. Unless you were driving gangway, then you were paid by the yard. Now, when the ore was hauled out of the mines, it was shipped down to the furnaces. But anything that wasn't ore had to be disposed of, get it out of the mine. You can see a tailing behind me that was long abandoned, but that would have been where all the rock that wasn't iron ore would have been dumped. A good indication as you walk around the hills of central Pennsylvania of whether or not you're in a mining area for iron ore are these tailings. If you see a giant lump of earth that just doesn't look natural, you're looking at the dump pit from one of these mines. Oh, I wish the mines were still running on the other side of town. I drown myself in labor in a life underground. There's something in a miner's life that's familiar to me. So what we're doing here is drilling into the block ore and we're getting ready to set our charges. And I've sung the song of a miner though I've never worked below. The words just come to me like it's something just a borrowed whisper I heard as a kid Words of the miners who work Montorange <coughs> Okay, gonna take out our star bit drill Called the star bit drill because of the way the end looks It's in the shape of a star And 
what we did is we drilled our hole several feet up into that ore. We're going to put in our explosives, going to tamp our explosives up in there, and then we're going to detonate the explosives, which is going to loosen all that ore, going to come down the chute, go into the gangway buggies, and load the ore up the slope. Okay, need our tamping bar. Going to take our black powder explosive and put it up in the hole. The black powder would have been manufactured locally. Going to put it up in the hole and then tamp it up in, all the way up in the back of that hole, all right? Now you'll notice on the end of the tamping bar is a little bit of a groove. And what we're going to put in that groove is our needle, okay? Push the needle up in, okay? Now what we're going to do is keep the needle in the hole and take our tamping bar and take handfuls of dirt off the mine floor push it up in the hole and tamp it up in there. That is when we set off this explosion, we don't want the explosion to come shooting out of the hole. We want the explosion to be trapped and break up all this iron ore. Another one up in there. Okay. Now what we do is withdraw the needle and instead of a real big hole, we got a real small hole going back to our explosive. Now we take our squib And our squib is a fuse with a small amount of explosive on the end. We're going to place that up in that hole left by the needle. Right about there. And then when we're ready, we're going to give out the warning to all the other miners down here in the ore mine that we're going to detonate the explosives. Fire! 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 Once the iron ore was blasted up on the pitch, as you see in the model here, gravity would push it down to what's called the chute in the gangway. You'd lift the chute board and gravity would fill the ore buggy in the gangway for you. Now, if there wasn't enough pitch, and that is if the land wasn't steep enough where that mine is, the ore had to be loaded by hand into the ore buggies. Um, now, the gangway would have been the only place in the mine where a man could stand upright. The reason it had to be that big is because a mule was what was going to then pull this gangway buggy uh, down towards the slope. So it had to be tall enough for a mule to be able to walk up and down the gangway. All the other parts of the mine were only as big as the ore bed itself, sometimes only a foot and a half to two feet in height. Now here in this model you're going to see a turntable which would have cost quite a bit of money so therefore only the mining, uh, the entrepreneurs with the most capital could afford to sink a slope mine. Now in this model you'll see this, the gangway buggy is then turned, put on the slope, and then hoisted up the slope. Now at the Harding slope they had what was called a donkey gin or mule gin. Some of the other slopes were steam powered with coal. But at the Harding slope in Frosty Valley uh, a donkey gin was used and as you see as the mules walked in a circle around the gin, one empty buggy would be lowered into the slope of the mine while a full buggy would have been pulled to the surface. And once the ore buggy was at the surface, it could be loaded into wagons and then hauled to furnaces, or in the model, as you see here, it could have been loaded into rail cars. This is an iron ore buggy uh, I made in 2003. It's a replica of the actual ore buggies that were used in the mines. It would hold a ton of iron ore. Uh, it's mounted on actual T-rails that was rolled here in Danville. There were several different methods that were employed to get the iron ore from the mines down to the towns where the furnaces were located. So it started with the simple horse and wagon. From there it actually went to where horses were pulling rail cars. But as time went on, iron becoming more popular, production increasing, they needed a better and more reliable way of getting the iron to the furnaces. Kind of unique to this area though, the Montour Iron Works, they took it a step up beyond. They actually invested large amounts of capital around the time of the Civil War to create a steam-driven narrow-gauge railroad like the one that you see behind me. This is an example of a railroad bed that basically is at about a one degree pitch for miles and miles. It would allow easy transport down into the furnaces from the mining areas.